Professor of American Studies at the University of Regensburg and Deputy Director of the Bavarian American Academy. And in this capacity, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, the presentation and discussion of Susan Nyman's book, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, that came out in the US to great success in 2019. And a German translation of the book has appeared a couple of months ago. The Bavarian American Academy is a network organization of scholars dealing with the United States and North America at Bavarian universities. We are operating under the roof of the America House, which has just been reopened and are something like the academic arm of this uh, institution. And as such, we organize conferences, we fund academic events on US history, literature, culture, and politics at Bavarian universities, things like talks or smaller workshops. We uh, most importantly support young scholars working on their dissertations and second books through scholarships, travel grants, and our dissertation prize. And uh, we cooperate widely and energetically with partner institutions in Munich, in Bavaria, in Germany, uh, and the United States. One such cooperation, which is dear to us at the BAA, is the cooperation with the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism that has been going on for quite some time now, and that is bringing you this event tonight. It is the last in a series of lectures and discussions under the title of This is America. The original idea for tonight was that the director of the Munich Documentation Center, Professor Mirjam Tsadov, would officially open the event, welcome you all, introduce tonight's guests of honor, and then hand over to me to moderate um, the discussion. Unfortunately, due to illness, Professor Sadov had to cancel her commitment on short notice so that you all have to put up with me alone, as Susan Nyman has to do as well, who I am delighted to introduce. Professor Nyman is a Jewish American professor of philosophy and the director of the Einstein Forum in Berlin. She has a truly transatlantic biography that unfolded between the United States, Israel, and Germany. She was born in Atlanta, Georgia, studied philosophy at Harvard and the Freie Universität Berlin, taught as a professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv universities. And in the year of 2000, she became director of the Einstein Forum in Berlin and has been serving in this capacity ever since. Her main fields of interest are moral philosophy, political philosophy, and the history of philosophy. And her major publications include Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists, and I really should read this. And then there are a couple of German books, uh, Fremde Sehen Anders zur Lage der Bundesrepublik, Widerstand der Vernunft, ein Manifest in postfaktischen Zeiten, and of course the book that we will be discussing tonight, Learning from the German, Learning from the German. So Professor Nyman, welcome to Munich. It is a great pleasure to have you with us here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Wish I could be there in person or IRL as the kids now say. Have you heard that one? No, in I haven't heard that one. In real life, IRL. Uh, Hope well, to see you I, I am sitting in Regensburg uh, facing the Danube, which is somehow flowing right uh, underneath my living room here. Okay, so learning from the Germans, race and the memory of evil uh, in German von den Deutschen Lernen, which I bought to actually support my German bookseller in times of Corona, uh, is a big book, more than 500 pages, but it is a wonderful read that does not get boring once, and I'm not fishing for compliments here. So I really had a good time reading your book. The book consists of three sections. The first is dealing with how Germans worked off the national socialist past and the problem of guilt from the end of the Second World War to the end of the Cold War. And what I find very interesting about it is that she takes both Germanys into consideration, looking at Vergangenheitspolitik in West Germany and also in the former GDR. Um, and um, the idea of somehow confronting guilt or the refusal to do so 
um, the refusal to work off the past as one major element of this uh, period. The second part of the book deals with how US society and especially Southern society worked through the history of slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, or again, refused to do so. And then the third part then looks at how the United Germany has confronted and worked off the National Socialist past and the Holocaust since the end of the Cold War. And from my reading of the book, it is in this period that the Vergangenheitspolitik in the United States and Germany began to part ways where they had been pretty similar in the decades before. But I'm curious to see and to hear what you have to say um, about this. Professor Nyman. Uh, to be uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Why don't we start out with you briefly summarizing the main ideas, the main thesis of your book in 25 words or less. I won't do it in 25 words or less, but I'll try and make it brief. So look, I'm under absolutely no illusions uh, that the minute the war was over, uh, the German nation got down on its knees and begged for atonement. The rest of the world actually kind of does think that because the most iconic photograph of post-war Germany that went around the world was that of Willy Brandt on his knees at the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. And that is stuck in people's minds and they find it appropriate. Of course, many of them don't even know that, that Brandt had nothing personal to atone for since he left the country as soon as uh, the Nazis took power. But they also don't know that Konrad Adenauer ran against him in 1962 successfully with the slogan, what was Herr Brandt doing for 12 years in Ausland? We know what we were doing in Germany. That is the very thing that made Brandt a good German in the eyes of the rest of the world, which was that he was genuinely repentant made him a bad German for a large proportion of the country. So I am not naive. Um, sometimes people see the title and I, I get letters sometimes from, I suspect older gentlemen who first of all think that armies don't know anything and an American woman, of course not. And I get letters from people who have either just seen the title or seen an interview and they want to say, well, unfortunately, Frau Neumann, es gab Versäumnisse bei der Deutschen Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. And I say, look, the first three chapters are all about the Versäumnisse. I know about them. Nevertheless, I think the Germans did two things that were incredibly important. Number one, they invented the concept of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. There is no other language that has that concept except as a direct translation from the German. And what that means is, as inclined as we are to uh, idealize and mythologize our countries, no country can have a sane, strong, healthy future if they bury all the crimes of their history. So that's point number one. Point number two, which is, um, I think, very important. We all would like to uh, see our people as heroes, whether it's our parents or our nation. When we can't do that, it's a very normal, it's a very normal desire. When we can't do that, what we tend to do is to see them as victims. Well, they were victims of history. They would have been heroes, but history went wrong and they became victims. One really important epiphany um, for my book was that the first several decades of West Germans behind closed doors or occasionally in print sounded exactly like the Southern defenders of the lost cause. We lost the war, cities were burned, you know, uh, everything was terrible. And on top of it all, the damn Yankees want to claim that the war was our fault. Exactly the same tones. But so it's a natural move to look at yourself as a victim, but what Germany did, which was not natural until it did it, was to make the third move, which is to say, you know what? Yes, we were wounded, but uh, other people were wounded worse and it's our fault. Now that is something that happened in West Germany, I would say, I would date it uh, with May 8th, uh, 1985 and Richard von Weizsäcker's famous speech calling May 8th a day of liberation. What Weizsäcker never really acknowledged is that it had been called the day of liberation in um, East Germany uh, since the very beginning. 
the most controversial thesis of the book um, uh, argues that the Dede era did many things better in the first decades after the war than East German, than West Germany did. I have never understood the reproach de verordneter antifascismus, which is the most that West Germans tend to say about the DDR. Because my question is always, well, wait a second, wasn't it right that after 13 years of Nazi propaganda, the government should verordnen antifascismus? And secondly, isn't the complaint that so many people make about the Adenauer years is that there was no verordneter antifascismus. There was no attempt from the government to take any responsibility to, uh, you know, put people, hold people responsible to rewrite the lesson plans, to restore the concentration camps, all that stuff. I, um, I'm, I don't have to go into that because I, at length, because I tend to find um, these claims uh, cause arguments which uh, tend to end in, or tend to begin with calling me a Stalinist. So I should say, I'm not a Stalinist. I'm not a communist. I'm not even a Marxist, although I have learned quite a bit from Marx. Um, I'm a socialist um, and I'm perfectly aware uh, that, you know, all was not well in the DDR, but I interviewed particularly people from the opposition, uh, incredibly important and impressive people like Jens Reich or Friedrich Schorlemmer, um, all of whom said, you know, we could criticize everything except the antifascismus, that was real. And all I am asking for, and then maybe we can end that topic now, I, I think it's a scandal that there is absolutely no Gesamtdeutsche Erinnerungspolitik. Uh, there are two completely different memories. And because for the last 20 years I have been living in Berlin but working in Brandenburg, I hear what Aussies and Vessies say about each other when the other isn't around. And it's often quite shocking. And all I am asking for is that if we talk about Deutsche Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, that we in a, as unideological way as possible, dass mm wir -hmm. eine sachliche Auseinandersetzung haben, because there were two German ways of dealing with the past and they need to be discussed. So, okay, so that was a general lesson of the first part of the book. The second was, um, and I certainly wanted to make those sets of claims to my German friends and colleagues, um, partly because there has been a tendency recently under prog among progressive Germans, you see I'm mixing up my prepositions, which shows that I'm thinking in two languages, sorry. Um, <laughs> among my, um, among many, you know, decent Germans, there's a, there has been a sense of despair since uh, the AfD came into parliament and the sense that, wait, we did all this Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung for nothing. It didn't make a difference. And my answer is, I'm not pleased about the AfD either. And I'm certainly not pleased about right-wing acts of terror against people of color or Jews, but look around guys and look at what's happening in Hungary, Poland, France, Britain, and the US. And Germany has actually succeeded in being less racist and less anti-Semitic. It isn't done, it isn't finished, it isn't perfect, um, but it is something that I think if you're going to fight to preserve it and extend it, you need to acknowledge that some progress has been made and it has been made. Mm -hmm. So with that message to my German friends and colleagues, I wanted to say to my American friends and colleagues, hey guys, believe it or not, the uh, you know descendants of the Nazis are doing a way better job than we are. And, uh, 
I decided to write this book, although I had been thinking about this subject really ever since I came to Berlin in 1982, I decided to write it after President Obama gave this, one of the great speeches of his presidency, his um, a, a eulogy for the nine churchgoers in Char Charleston, South Carolina, killed by a white supremacist. Some people may know it as the speech after which he sang Amazing Grace, about which there's been a song written and a book written and all kinds of things. It was, anyway, I was standing in my um, office here in Berlin with tears running down my cheeks. And the interesting thing was that was the first time that a high American public official had said, we've got to take down the Confederate flag. And Nikki Haley, the Republican governor of South Carolina did it and the Republican governor of Alabama did it. And Walmart, the largest retailer in America said, we're not gonna sell Confederate mem memorabilia. And I thought, hey, they're actually beginning a Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. Maybe there's something that I can contribute because I have been paying attention to all of this stuff since 1982. And I decided to, um, I had a sabbatical coming to me and I decided to spend it in the deep South. And I always have to emphasize this. It's not because I think racism isn't a problem in other places. We just saw George Floyd was killed about as far North as you can go in the United States. And you know, the Ku Klux Klan has more members in Indiana than they do in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So racism is not only a problem in, in the deep South, but the Deep South works like a magnifying glass. I think it has the best and the worst of America. And they are very conscious of their history. They get it wrong all the time, or many of them do. But um, it's, it's just a place to focus attention. And so I spent uh, over half a year um, based in Mississippi, but traveling to many other places in the Deep South talking both to people who were refusing to remember their history um, or you know, whitewashing it or various, but also people black and white who were working very hard um, in what can only be called a Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung even if there's no American word for it. Mm -hmm. So, Is that the answer? Those are the main theses of the book, I think. Um, one thing, I mean, this is what we discussed when we prepared for this um, session, this whole problem of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, which is really a German word. And there was a time when we talked about Vergangenheitsbewältigung, where a scholar like Kozelek, Reinhard Kozelek, always said, you can never really bewältig a Vergangenheit. Um, this is never over. You cannot overcome it. Um, you cannot uh, eradicate guilt. Uh, so Vergangenheitsbewältigung is not what we're after, but Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. Um, what word did you use in the English uh, version of your book? Uh, lacking this kind of term, but also the concept, obviously. Yeah. Um, so. It's not often that I agree with Kozelek, but I do agree that I do agree with Kozelek very often. So, but that should not be between us. Okay, um, you may know his work much better than I do, so that's fine. Um, but I totally agree that um, you know, bewältigung was the wrong word because it suggests that if you have a magic, you know, formula, you can pay off your debts and be over and done with it. And I don't think that's true. I think it's very important that it's not true, actually. I don't like the term Erinnerungskultur because I think it's euphemistic. Because why are we supposed to remember? We're supposed to remember because we're supposed, first of all, when people talk about Erinnerungskultur or memory studies as they do in the States, um, you say, well, why is it always about bad memories? You know what I mean? Um, so, I think it's a, it's a euphemistic way of um, avoiding the problem. I translate it as working off the past. You could also translate it, it seems to me, as working through the past. Um, you know, you could say there's a problem with each translate because working off is like working off a debt. And so then eventually the debts might be paid. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will be in 10 generations, it's possible. Um, 
Okay, thanks. Um, let's come back to one of your theses. Uh, so this third move, when did it happen? Um, and somehow comparing the uh, former GDR with the Federal Republic of Germany, you argue that somehow from in, in the GDR case, it was somehow a, a process that happened from the state's foundation and somehow was deeply uh, part of um, yeah, GDR culture without having been verordnet just, right? And I think uh, you are right. I spent parts of my life in Greifswald coming as a Vesi to um, East Germany to do my habilitation, which I couldn't have done uh, in the West. Um, so I'm a profiteer of somehow German unification. But this, this very deep difference in remembering um, the past in dealing with all this, uh, so I can fully uh, subscribe to that, but I think your uh, third move, your focus on Richard von Weizsäcker as the major turning point is maybe a bit too strong. Because I mean, I was, I was I starting my studies back then in the 80s. And when he gave his speech, of course, I still remember the, the uproar or the, the, the controversy it caused. But from my point of view, it was somehow in the air that somebody would say something like that. Um, so, um, and, and somehow digging into that a little deeper, I mean, the Institut für Zeitgeschichte was founded in 1953 already, which was some sort of the academic uh, investigation of how national socialism worked. Then we have the 68ers who claimed that they were the ones who actually started this debate on, um, on the national socialist past. And, and where, we, where were you, daddy, when all of this happened? Where was grandpa when this happened? I personally still remember 1979 when the miniseries Holocaust was on television, uh, where we as kids were not allowed to watch this because this was too somehow controversial and maybe too brutal. So I, I remember my, my parents watching this all by themselves and somehow then whispering about it. Um, so when somehow Richard, White, Richard von Weizsäcker uh, gave his speech, I had the feeling that this was more the result of a process that had been going on for quite some time and that it was somehow in the air, which of course then reduces somehow the, the, the depth of the caesura that you suggest in your book. So look, I, uh, I, I'm really sorry if you got that impression because I thought and hoped that I, I did the 68ers justice, mm -hmm. probably not enough. In fact, I get quite angry when people start dumping on the 68ers, which is also a common thing to do because the one thing they did right was to rub the Nazi period in their parents and teachers' faces and insist that it be talked about. And the passage where I interview, have a long uh, interview with Volkart Knigge and talk about, I mean, I, I, I do. So the difference is this, um, although I don't uh, accept entirely the uh, phrase verordnete fasci uh, anti-fascismus, what's true is that it was a top-down effort in the DDR, which many, many sources tell me was actually genuinely felt by a majority of citizens of the DDR. And if you look at, you know, there were a thousand DEFA films made about the Holocaust and other Nazi crimes, which, some of which you can still look at today. Uh, when the West Germans were doing Heimat films and had to wait until 1980 to get Holocaust on television. So, um, so it was a part of popular culture, but it was certainly came, this was the government position. And the only thing that I meant to say with Weizsäcker is that was the moment when it became the government position. But absolutely, it was in the air. It was pushed by enormous number of, you know, first of all, as you mentioned, Wissenschaftler. There were plenty of uh, artists, you know, they were kind of on the border of the street. There was Aktion Zünezeichen. Um, there were a lot of things. And in, in particular, there was 1968, mm -hmm. which was very different in Germany than in Paris or in Berkeley, precisely because of how important this is. And there were people digging up the, um, the Gestapo torture chambers in Berlin. That was civil society. Mm -hmm. And I think what you had in West Germany was slowly, but in a kind of snowball effect, P civil society pushing the government to take a certain position. I agree with you entirely, and I'm sorry if that wasn't 
clear. I mean, we had the government again in this very short term of Willy Brandt, mm -hmm. but it, his position was so unpopular and his term was unfortunately so short that, that it seems to me that 85 marks something where the government line officially was, uh, you know what, this is not a day of defeat. We should be glad that the Nazis were defeated. And it, that was an important moment, but I was in Berlin and I remember listening to that and uh, my German was certainly good enough to understand it by that point. It wasn't that I didn't understand it, but I did not understand why anybody could get excited about this speech because I thought he was just saying banalities. Yes, the Germans suffered, but other people suffered worse and we started the war. And I, I, I really didn't understand in 1985 why people needed to hear that. But of course, now I know more and they did need and, to hear And you write about that in your book, how you felt when you heard this and how you somehow had the idea, well, this is somehow banal because he's just basically saying what everybody knows. Um, and you also take this theme then to, to the South and how they deal with, with slavery and all of that. Which brings me um, to this question, reading your book, I never was too sure what kind of text this is. So it is partly autobiography and you keep referring to your biographical experiences starting 1982 in Berlin and how you experienced um, this part of German history. Then parts of it read more like some sort of reportage. You interview people. Uh, you you describe um, certain places. You 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 describe characters. Um, partly you resort to philosophical treaties like um, remarks. So what kind of text is that? Hmm. You know, I, when people ask me, friends ask me that question while I was working on the book, and they were especially surprised. You're doing interviews. I did hundreds of interviews. The book would have been three times as long if I had used all the interviews. Um, and what I said at the time was, it's a mishmash. Mm -hmm. And then my friend, the journalist and sociologist, uh, Todd Gitlin, um, wrote a review or a blurb in which he said, she's invented a new genre, uh, investigative philosophy. And I was <laughs> so, I just, I gave him a hug. I said, I thank you for that. It's not a mishmash anymore. <laughs> it's a new genre. Look, um, of course, it's not an entirely new genre. If you ask uh, who probably my biggest hero, uh, well, I don't know, I have a number of heroes, but one of them is Jean Marie, uh, who, although he didn't even finish high school, neither did I, by the way, um, he I consider him a philosopher as well as a writer. I know that he's considered an essayist, which is a bit of a, you know, sort of term. But uh, I, he's, he's one of the thinkers I respect the most. And he has this capacity, so does James Baldwin, by the way, is another writer who's influenced me, um, to move between uh, reporting subjective experience, whether his own or someone else's, and philosophical reflection. And I don't see why one can't do that. When I decided to study philosophy, it was not because I had been reading Aristotle and Plato as a teenager. I was reading Sartre and de Beauvoir as a teenager. And uh, that's just what I thought philosophy was. Of course, you know, <laughs> it shows how provincial I was at the time, but the conflict between moving between genres, between writing literature and writing philosophy, it just doesn't seem to me to be a necessary conflict. And um, I have felt that it was really important, first of all, to use my voice as a way, not of saying everything is subjective, but as a way of saying, this is where I stand. I'm taking responsibility for certain positions and I'm thinking them through. And I'm not always certain yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that people have said they liked about the book is that I, I also talk about my own thinking process on the question of reparations and I look at counter arguments and so on. And this is reparations for slavery. Um, so there's that, but then in the question of interviewing people, I just felt it's not very interesting to write a general uh, you know, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, as you will know from the German case, even if your intellectual field is American history, um, you know, it's about confrontation between children and parents. 
It's about what songs you listen to or what movies you weren't allowed to watch or were allowed to watch. It's very particular. And those particularities interested me much more than any abstract claims that could be made about them, which is why I wanted to interview and have a lot of different voices in the book. I think this is what makes it so interesting to read. Um, because you somehow blend uh, autobiographical experiences with uh, this kind of reportage, journalistic investigation, uh, investigative philosophy. And, and I think this is why I could really not put this book down um, because it never was an abstract kind of elaboration. It was not just mere autobiography or subjectivity. It was something in between. Although I found that the parts on America were much more as uh, subjective experience driven than uh, the German ones where you also talked about somehow institutionalizations where you talked about where I had the feeling that is much more the perspective from the outside. You were much more analytical, I think, uh, in terms of talking about Germany than you were in your descriptions of the, uh, of the, of the South. Uh, you're probably right about that. Um, and that may be because the very first book I ever wrote, which is, never was translated into German, but you mentioned it, Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, um, was a little bit in this vein, um, but it was all about Berlin. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I must have, without thinking too much about it, I must have, I did all that because I really did in those, in, in that book, um, it, you know, talked about, Berlin in the 80s with a lot of particularity and a lot of stories. And so maybe that's the reason I didn't do it here. And maybe it was a mistake, I don't know, but. Well, there's just a question from the audience about the Weizsäcker uh, speech that we just uh, discussed a little bit. Um, and and the, uh, the question is, isn't its real significance that he repudiated the idea of collective guilt as opposed to individual guilt uh, in, um, in his speech. Uh, so was that a way basically to continue um, this, um, to not confront uh, the notion of, of, of guilt? That's a question from the audience that I'm picking up because we have just discussed this. It's a very good question. And I'm far from saying that I thought it was a terrific speech. Um, you know, had I been writing it, well, first of all, I wouldn't have defended my father in court, <laughs> my other things, so, and thought he was unfairly sentenced to the rest of his life, apparently. Uh, Richard von Weizsäcker thought that. Um, I would have done it very differently. And I, I, do, see, um, I do see that point. I believe, by the way, that one needs to distinguish between guilt and shame. And I do not think you can feel guilt for something that you personally didn't do. I think you can and often should feel shame for something that your nation did because you are responsible for part of a nation. But certainly for the people who were too young to have voted for or opposed the Nazis, I think it makes sense to say there should not have been any collective guilt. What I realized in studying that speech when I went back to look at it in writing this book, um, to try to understand what I didn't understand when I heard it and thought, this is, who needs this, you know, piece of obviousness. Um, and it's not even very strong. I mean, I of course would have preferred something much stronger. Um, I decided, look, he knew his country people in a way that I did not. And he took them along. Mm -hmm. And by beginning, by emphasizing their suffering, which no one talked about, um, by beginning with that, it was a kind of acknowledgement that allowed him to carry people with him. And so rhetorically, I think it did what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I agree that it didn't do enough, mm -hmm. but for you know the majority, for all the Germans who hated Willy Brandt for falling on his knees 15 years earlier, it 
had resonance, clearly. It had this impact. Yeah, I can agree with that. Although from a different kind of generational perspective, but uh, we have already talked about that. Now, coming back to the title, um, I thought it was prone to cause misunderstandings, especially somehow in times of a resurging right-wing nationalism, this whole idea of learning from the Germans, this kind of chauvinistic potential, which uh, may even relieve us of uh, our guilt insofar as we are so good or our shame, because as we are so good in somehow confronting this and, and working this off. Uh, Bettina Stangnet, who you, who you mentioned as one of the- Stangnet. Most, huh? Stangnet, you mean? Yes. Yeah, the philosopher. Yeah, you, there's a passage in your book where you somehow refer to a, a talk that you had with her where she basically denies anything can be learned, that anything can be learned from the Germans. Um, so how did this title come to pass? Uh, and uh, would you, uh, or, or, or I mean, what, what, what is the, uh, what is the, um, what was the idea behind this? I mean, it is a provocation, I think. Yeah, it is, and that was deliberate. And Bettina says, by the way, she still gets Bauchweh when she sees the title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I don't know a single German who pats herself or himself on the back about Germany. I know two kinds of people. There is, of course, the AF Day who says enough already and no other nation has ever plant, planted a mark of shame in the middle of their capital. He was right, Hooker. No other nation has done it. It's actually something that I think the German nation can be proud of. So, you know, people who want to say, you know, stop it with the Schuldkult. I mean, I don't really know these people personally, but we read about them in the papers. But everybody else I know, either they laughed when they, in Germany, either they laughed when they heard the title, or in one case, I was yelled at loudly that I should never publish a book with this title. I actually saw the person who yelled at me. I ran into him today. Um, he's a, I won't name him, but he's a very well-known politician in the SPD, um, former politician. He said, well, I guess I am one of those Germans who thinks nothing could possibly have been learned from us. And as I said at the beginning, um, I really, you know, I, if, and I, this is a general point that I've made in other more straightforwardly philosophical books, if you don't think some progress has been made, you will become too depressed, cynical, or resigned ever to make more. And that's a Kantian point, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have to go into that. Um, so not to acknowledge that something has been done is actually it's usually, it's not in a tone of we have to do more. We have to deal with the colonial past. We have to deal with Germans of color, all of which I truly believe, you know? But it's never with that tone. It's we tried, we failed, that's it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're just a mess. And maybe we should stop reading Goethe again. Um, oh, yeah. I'm all for that, really. <laughs> you're, all for re you're all for stopping reading Goethe? I think we're reading too much of Goethe. Interesting. Uh, and, um, but anyway, let's when not... I, let's, let's, when I came to Berlin in 1982, none of the uh, people I met, you know, would go near Goethe because all of German culture was contaminated. And I think that's a great mistake. One of the things that I admire about Steinmeier, and I quote, uh, him towards the end of the book is that I think he's trying really very hard to work out a nuanced relation to German history. Mm -hmm. And he is trying to take his nation along to say, yes, we can never forget Kristallnacht, but we also need to remember that November 9th was also the first, uh, the date of the first Republic on German soil mm -hmm. and German history. And he said this year, you, it's a country you can only love with a broken heart. So I, um, I think Germans need to develop a more nuanced relationship to history and not just say, you know, Von den Deutschen lernen spinnt die Frau, also weiß 
<laughs> I mean, I that's, that's... But of course, I also wanted to provoke the Americans and the Brits mm -hmm. and the Dutch, by the way, those are the languages that it's appeared already in and there's been a discussion, who so demonized the Nazis. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, I got into an argument some years ago with um, some very nice, very educated left-wing Brits who we somehow got into a discussion of the film, The Reader with Kate Winslet. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad book and a worse film. And what they told me was, well, I learned so much from it. It was the first time I could ever picture a, Germ a, a German even, or, but also a Nazi eating apple crumble. And I thought, my God, what did you do? Think they had horns and tails and were spitting fire, you know? Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, is the answer for an awful lot of people outside Germany for whom German just means Nazi still. So to write a book for Americans and Brits and other people called Learning from the Germans um, was a deliberate provocation. I have to tell you that although it provoked many people when I was working on the book, 16, 17, beginning of 18, I was still interviewing people um, in America. And I would have to say, this is what I'm doing. Can you tell me about what you're working on? It provoked a lot of people. When I went on book tour last fall all over the country, no one objected to it at all after three years of Donald Trump in office. And I know that the debate about how how close is he to a fascist or not, which fills the mainstream American press. It's not known over here. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised, but it's not reprinted. But okay. Republicans are now saying, the people who are now leaving the sinking ship reminds me, remind me of Vichy. That was a former Republican governor last week in the Washington Post, which is really not a left wing rag. You know, so um, after three years of Donald Trump, no American was provoked by the title, but Germans still are. Um, but this gives me the chance to ask one of the questions that comes from the audience, uh, which is about, uh, do you have any recommendations on how white Americans can most effectively address their nation's egregious acts against humanity, particularly when using social media as a platform. I mean, so this is more, instead of just provoking, um, but what are some of the recommendations um, for the American way of working off the past? You know what's so wonderful is they're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, and what has happened since George Floyd's murder is more than I could have hoped for. Social media is problematic. As we know, there's a boycott of Facebook, though for good, very good reasons. Mark Zuckerberg is gonna have a lot to account for, but um, what's happening right now is that sales of books about race and racism are off the charts in America. Um, you know, people are, and, and this is what is so good, white people are informing themselves in a way that we weren't informed before. And I speak of myself too, even though I grew up in the South, even though my mother was involved with the civil rights movement, I did not, for example, know when those statues were built. I thought they were just war commemoration statues and people were honoring, which is what they claim, the Confederates, honoring their fathers or brothers who fell in the war. Actually, they were built at two particular times in history when it looked as if black people were going to actually get civil rights. And at that moment, the Confederates started building white supremacist statues. But I didn't know that until we started discussing it. So people are discussing it. Um, there is an absolutely wonderful um, memorial called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice 
known colloquially as the National Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, built by really one of my heroes who I um, uh, interviewed for the book, partly because he said he was in, influenced uh, in his work by this, his work be by the Germans. He began, he's an African-American who got a law degree from Harvard, which means that he could have done 30 some years ago, whatever he wanted to do in the world, you know, work, make lots of money or whatever. He could have done anything except go to Alabama and defend men on death row, which is what he did and has been doing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it was Stevenson who first connected the uh, incredible rate of execution of black people with lynching in American history. So, He's the paradigm of somebody who has connected those two cases and worked in those two cases. He now has built, he built something called the uh, Equal Justice Initiative and he's got scores of lawyers, white and black, who are dying to work for him and do work for him. Um, and, but he, uh, for example, he, one of the things he told me was in addition to putting up monuments uh, to the people who were lynched, he said, there were white people who opposed lynching and you don't know their names. We need monuments to those people. So, I mean, what needs to happen is a rethinking of who we valorize and who we want to valorize, because it's not just about history. Monuments are not about history. They're about values. And, you know, we decide which bits of history we want to memorialize according to the values we have. So these discussions are taking place right now. People are talking very seriously about things like police reform, but sweeping police reform. I mean, not just a little bit here and a little bit there. There is a debate going on about reparations for slavery that began last year in Congress and is really picking up steam. I thought somebody had been trying to bring up that bill since um, 1987, just for discussion. And the fact that five of the presidential candidates in the Democratic race, all of them white, five of them even talked about reparations for slavery um, and that something is happening there is enormously hopeful. And, you know, it, the figures are slightly different. We don't have absolutely hard numbers on how many people participated in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, um, but it's the biggest demonstration that ever took place in the United States and the majority of people were white. Um, so it is happening right now and I'm extremely hopeful and there are very intelligent conversations going on. Uh, about how to keep up the momentum and what to do, where Black Lives Matter itself realized, listen, if three times more people of color are dying of COVID-19 uh, than white people, maybe we don't want to be in the streets all the time, even with masks. So there's less emphasis right now on demonstrating, although there will be a big demonstration on the anniversary of the March on Washington in August, the famous one where Martin Luther King said, I had a dream. I spoke last week to, on a video just like this, uh, an organization of um, American art museum directors, 100 people thinking about what should we do? Um, and how can we make our, first of all, how can we make our collections more diverse, our visitors more diverse? What should we do with monuments? Um, and some of the biggest museums in America are all really thinking about this. But, so I, mean, this I am hopeful. Yeah, but this makes me wonder a little bit because when you look at what's happening in my field, American studies, all we have been doing since the 1980s is to multiply the voices, to tell the different stories of uh, the American past, uh, the questions of beginnings, uh, the idea to have African Americans not just as objects of an essentially white history, but as agents, as subjects in this kind of history. It's all about somehow telling alternative stories. So, I mean, this is in the field of academia. This is all around. Um, Right. So what do you make of 
this this discrepancy between somehow an academic awareness of all these things and the seeming lack of a public awareness of all these things as you are, have been talking about uh, the last couple Academics of months. Academics need to learn to write better. That's not <laughs> the only problem, but I'm sure you know that uh, in the academic community, you often get penalized for writing in a way that is open to a general audience. It's not taken seriously um, by your fellow professors. That just happens. And it's the biggest mistake that we make. It's not the only reason why the way from the university to popular culture is so long. There are obviously other reasons, but if there's one thing, I sometimes call myself a re recovering academic, so I'm not quite sure where I stand on this, but um, if I, still, I, you know, I, I mean, I got my training at Harvard. I did all, I went through all the steps. I was a professor of philosophy, um, you know, so part of me is an academic, but if there's a single thing that we can do to change that dynamic that you're talking about, which is of course the universities have been talking about this for 30 years, at least. Um, if there's a single thing that we can do, it's to write better. And to fight back against, and to do this by the way for younger colleagues, uh, younger colleagues don't get tenure if they write uh, you know, for a popular audience. It's not counted. It's not, and it's not only not counted, um, it counts against them. And so for people to stick up for ways of writing that reach people, you know, I, I have to tell this to people, even Immanuel Kant, who was not a great writer, was not a great stylist, and he knew it. Kant wrote 15 essays for the Berlinische Monatschrift, which you can look at as a sort of latter day, it's not quite, I mean, somewhere between Die Zeit and Merkur, if you want a German framework, it's not quite that, but it was a popular journal, people read it, it was not a scholarly journal. Um, most people know the piece, Was heißt Aufklärung, but he wrote 14 other pieces. So even Kant, um, you know, that most dense and dry sometimes, not always, of great philosophers, even Kant thought it was part of his job to write for what he called the Gemeine Leserwelt. And we need to be doing that too. Again, it's not the only mm -hmm. reason, but it's one of them. What affects people, I mean, popular culture is just the lie of the lost cause was more perpetuated by Hollywood, which was just beginning its rise at the time, than by anything else. And it wasn't just Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind, which were the two blockbusters and the two most famous movies for a very long time. I looked this up, I was surprised. Some, somebody wrote an academic book, probably maybe you know the person in American studies, cataloging of Hollywood films made about the Civil War, how many were pro-Confederate and how many were pro-Union. And it was like 10 to one pro-Confederate because being a rebel is cool. Everybody wants to be a rebel. So, I mean, I'm not saying we should all write movies, um, although it's a wonderful you know, uh, profession if you can do it. But I am saying that we all need to reach out to somebody other than our colleagues and our graduate students. And not just talk to ourselves. I can fully agree with that. And maybe also write bigger books about the big questions. Um, I think we are in many cases too minute in, our, in the relevance of what we're doing. And, I agree entirely. Yeah. Um, one question relating to that, I mean, one, and, and maybe also coming back to this question, what are the recommendations? Uh, how should we somehow deal with these monuments? I mean, currently in the US, it's uh, all about these Confederate soldiers, Confederate monuments, and the answer all too often is we'll take them down, uh, which of course is one way of dealing with that, but um, there are many other ways. What would be your ideal way of dealing with problematic monuments, statues in the public sphere, which are part of popular culture. I mean, we have been discussing this, uh, this now, and 
Um, what, what would be your recommendation for that? I love the way you use the word ideal way and recommendation because it's obviously not going to happen exactly as I imagine it. But my hopeful ideal would be to consider each case separately, democratically, and to use it for each community where these statues exist to both learn about their own histories and to talk about what values they want to replace those, uh, those generals and what, who, they, who they want to represent their communities. It is happening in some places. I mean, I, I, I know of a couple of places in Mississippi and Alabama where that's actually happening. Um, and I've talked to people both in Britain and the States uh, there are artists making interesting proposals. I, I think probably all the Confederate monuments should go. Um, I, I just, um, or be, you know, so radically contextualized that they look ridiculous. That was one tack tried in Alabama where they passed a law a few years ago saying it was absolutely illegal to remove any monument be, you know, that was made before, I don't know, anyway. And so what people did was they did funny, I mean, it, more than putting Klan suits on these people, although that's one thing that you could do, uh, making them look like clowns, making them, you know, there, there are different things that one can do. Um, some of them can be contextualized, I like what was done in um, at uh, Monticello, which was Thomas Jefferson's residence. Absolutely gorgeous. He did design it. That house struck me as the perfect mixture of the best of European and the best of American enlightenment. But what people began to do about 10 years ago was to excavate the slave cabins <laughs> And you can now take two tours of Monticello. Uh, you see Jefferson's gorgeous house and you hear about how Jefferson lived. And then you take a tour that really involves you in the lives of the people that he enslaved. And that strikes me as, as very successful. You know, again, you have to, you have to look at these these questions really case by case. When students a few years ago wanted to change the names of uh, the name of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy, um, my first reaction was, "Kids, isn't you know, aren't there bigger problems to worry about? Really, seriously?" Um, and the argument at the time was, maybe we shouldn't judge people exactly by the standards of our time. But he actually turned the clock back. He was the president who resegregated um, federal employment and, you know, which was the first time black people had had a chance to do decent jobs that weren't uh, cotton picking or being a maid. He, you know, he kicked them all out of government service. I thought, okay, I see that argument. But what really did it for me was seeing the movie Birth of a Nation, which you've probably seen as an Americanist. Um, but maybe the audience has not. Birth of a Nation is a silent film. It was the first Hollywood blockbuster. It was uh, the first film to be shown in the White House, Wilson's White House. And since it was a silent film, it needed a couple of quotes. And when I got to the quote that said, Finally, there arose a great organization to protect the Ku Klux Klan to protect the Aryan nation and signed Woodrow Wilson's History of America. And at that point I said, ah, rename, <laughs> rename the School of Public Policy. You know, so, so I think, and, and I've heard that, I mean, I've heard people discuss that particular case who didn't even know that fact. And so again, as somebody who believes in the enlightenment, my, my hope for the discussions around the monuments is that we really learn, use these as, uh, as an occasion to learn something. 
Whether and to what extent that will happen is not yet clear, but people have already learned a lot and that's important. Are you saying something? Because I'm not hearing you. Falka? Um, Falka? Hmm. We have a problem with the sound. One last question before we can have a couple of questions from the audience. So what are the... Um, what are the experiences made with this book so far? Um, I mean, you uh, there will be a second edition coming out. You have a new afterword or, or, or introduction written. Um, so what are what were the experiences with this book uh, so far? I mean, you have talked about a bit uh, that it was well received in the U.S. That uh, the Americans didn't really stumble over the title. Um, so what is uh, the uh, the experience made with this book? Uh, it's, it's really been the most satisfying, you know, experience I've ever had with something that I wrote because um, people are so interested. Um, and, you know, especially when I got to do live audiences, which I may do again, um, cause I enjoy them. Um, people talk about their own experiences and you know they're really touched by it. They're really forced to um, think about it. And uh, I've been very moved by uh, also letters that I've gotten from a very wide variety of people. Um, a lot of teachers, which is nice. Um, but also, I mean, you know, school teachers. I think mostly, but not all, high school level. Um, oh, this is one interesting experience. Every American who I met, who spent a serious amount of time in Germany said, I thought when I was there, somebody should write that book. Now you've done it. You know? <laughs> that is, I'm not the only person to whom it occurred. Why don't we do any of the, the sort of work that Germans unwillingly, fitfully, reluctantly, but nevertheless got done. Um, in Germany, in, in England, they were initially much more, much less enthusiastic since Black Lives Matter. Um, that has changed radically. And the Brits, I tell this, the Americans, makes the Americans feel better when I tell them it's true. I said, look, America be, may be behind Germany on this, but um, Britain is way behind us. And so, uh, and that was true until two months, it's not even two months when people really started talking about British history and, and now they're very interested. In Germany, you know, basically I said, uh, first of, you know, the main reaction is, do you know what you're talking about? Do you know how bad things were here in the 50s? And so I said, yeah, I do read the book. Um, the only thing for which I get hate mail is um, the chapter on the day day air, but only by people who haven't read the chapter. They've read, you know, like four sentences about it. And I've gotten some real hate mail. But I think uh, along the lines of what, how can you possibly find something good in the GDR or what is well, that's the toe. If they would only stop there, it would be fun. Sie sind einfach ekelig. I really, uh, links radikaler Ekelfrau. All right, that's too bad to hear. Um, there were a couple of questions from the audience, uh, but I don't have anything in the chat function. Can somebody help me out? I remember one question. Um, this idea that Germans could be proud uh, of their Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, isn't that um, the best reason to stop doing this? Um, was one question from the audience that I remember. There's a wonderful quote from Richard Rorty, the philosopher, 
I'm not a huge fan of all of his books, but he wrote a wonderful book called Achieving Our Country, which was a very thoughtful book about, Amer maybe you know it, uh, Foyka, about um, American history. He said, I really must know, learn this by heart because it's important. Patriotism is to nations what self-respect is to individuals, a necessary condition for improvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, that says it all. Okay. All right, there is another question uh, from the audience. Uh, is it possible that Germany's liberation by America in 1945 was one of the reasons that the US did not work through its history as the morally superior liberator? First of all, I have to question uh, the premise. Germany was not liberated by America. The Soviet army uh, lost 13 million men in liberating Germany. The American army lost 400,000. Not that I don't respect the sacrifice of every single person who did fight, but um, it, it's that kind of, let's say, historical forgetting that can sometimes um, drive me up a wall. Mm -hmm. So let's just start from that. But the answer is nevertheless, no. America has thought of itself as morally superior since its very inception. Um, that, yeah, I just wrote a book about American exceptionalism. Oh, um, then I will go and order that book. Thank you. Well, um, I, okay, well then you can answer the question better than I can. I mean, I'll just, I'll summarize my view and then maybe you can answer yeah. it. I, my view is that it, what is exceptional about America is that instead of just being this, you know, uh, tribe that went wandering around and decided to land somewhere where there was a good harbor or a nice wind or whatever and then built some political structure, America claimed to be founded on a set of ideals. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The problem is, and endowed by their creator with rights among them, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, every American school child knows this, um, the problem is those ideals were violated from uh, its inception. They were violated with Native Americans and they were violated with African Americans. And, and women too. Women's rights were violated everywhere. <laughs> so let's, let's just that. Not, under, not under the auspices of this egalitarian radicalism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, thank you for pointing that out. It's just, it, it's just not, particular to the United States. We, you know, the world had a problem for a very long time and we've made some progress on that front, if not complete progress. Um, so, but what, because Americans were so hell bent on holding up these ideals, any ways in which they had been violated um, was just something that people wanted to repress. So no, it has nothing to do with the Second World War. It's been going on way longer. That's my view. But if you just read a book about I mean, it. I would say that on the one hand, exceptionalism is a form of nationalism. And this brings me to one of the major differences between Germany and the United States, at least as I experienced them. I mean, I went to school in, in the US in the 70s. And, and there, I mean, every, every rodeo, every circus uh, performance was opened with the national anthem. Uh, flags were all over the place. Uh, there was some sort of a banal uh, yeah, identification with all things American. And this was a kind of nationalism that me coming from Germany uh, could not really relate to because we had such a broken relationship. Uh, and, and you mentioned Goethe. I never I had the problem with Goethe being contaminated. I had the problem that it was only Goethe that we read in school and there was nothing but Goethe. Oh, okay. um, that, was, that was more or less my problem. Uh, but we had a very broken relationship to nationalism. Uh, and I mean, we were, I, I can still remember the debate, is it okay to wear the national shirt of the soccer team uh, without being jingoistic? Is it okay to fly German flags in the uh, world championships finals and all of that stuff? And my, my impression was that somehow it is this very broken relation to nationalism that was one basis for why in the end, 
uh, we could somehow work off the past in the way that we did. Whereas in American nationalism is so deeply and still so deeply ingrained. Uh, and maybe this idea of that this is an unbroken success history of freedom, which of course encompasses denying all the things that do not belong in there. But I think the narratives of American identity are so flexible that even a disaster like the Civil War or slavery can be integrated into this narrative of an enduring experiment in liberty to the effect that now even Donald Trump is referring to Martin Luther King as a great hero of freedom and liberty. I mean, uh, whatever you may think of that, but I think the kind of narratives that we that, uh, that define America's national identity are so flexible that they can integrate even the most traumatic uh, traumatic uh, events as somehow meaningful in this overarching narrative of an enduring march toward freedom. So I have to disagree with you a little bit because while I agree that the narrative has always been, uh, well, we were founded on these ideals. Well, maybe we didn't always realize them, but the history is a progressive realization of those ideals, which of course you and I know is not true. But one thing that America has that Germany doesn't have, and here I think we're very fortunate, we have always had this concept of the other America. Mm -hmm. That is the Americans who fought to realize the ideals that were being violated. And, you know, whether you want to talk about Emerson and Thoreau or Frederick Douglass or Paul Robeson and Woody Guthrie, um, there's a whole list of people um, who have played that role for the American left. And I grew up with that, although my parents were, I mean, they were liberals. They weren't at all, uh, you know, at all leftist, I can remember my mother saying that Martin Luther King made a great mistake when he criticized the war in Vietnam, that he shouldn't have done that, okay? Um, so, and I, one of the things that I find really interesting and moving, you might think that since uh, African-Americans ancestors were brought against their will, that there would be a big back to Africa movement, but there wasn't, there were, two tiny back to Africa movements and they weren't very successful. Um, what great African-American heroes did and you know, from Douglas to Robeson to Toni Morrison was to say, we are going to hold the country's feet to the fire. We are going to insist that they realize the ideals that they taught us in school. Now, there are a lot of white people who did that too. Um, I find it particularly impressive that so many black people did it, but um, so we have that idea that there is another America. And, um, but you know, my view is every country, I mean, no country is entirely, you know, guilt-free or guilty. Every country has uh, facets of its history. My, I wrote a book, you, you mentioned, I think all my books, thank you. Um, you. You didn't mention my book, Why Grow Up. Um, yeah, should have done that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but it's, I, I only mention it not to criticize you, but to say growing up is something that I've thought a lot about, perhaps partly because I'm the mother of three children, but um, uh, also for other reasons. And it seems to me that to become a grown up individual, what you really need to do is to sift through all the stuff that you got from your parents and um, when you couldn't do anything about it because they decided where you were gonna live church or synagogue or whatever, or what music was gonna be put on the stereo, all of that stuff, um, as well as you know, stronger sets of values. You, you sift through it and if, unless you're really unlucky and your parents really were like Hans Frank, the father of Nicholas Frank, say, um, Unless you're really unlucky, you can always find things about your parents where you could say, you know, I'm really glad they did it that way. And I, if I could have chosen, I would have chosen to do it that way. That stuff they did, you know, 
Uh, I'm not proud of, I don't like it. I'm not gonna pass it on to my own kids. And I really do think that our relationship to our countries is in that way similar to our relationship to our nations, if we're going to have a grown up relationship to either, mm -hmm. is that we go through the culture that we were imposed. If, if we can't find anything to value about it, we're in trouble. Uh, um, but usually we can. And that's an important process. If you like, you can say that's, you know, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung in a word is okay. doing that work of sifting through. Yeah. And then somehow reaching an adult position, um, probably like that. So I think we are way beyond the original time frame. There are two questions from the audience that I want to somehow raise, and they seem to be connected. And then I think we should call it a day because. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, one question was, if monuments are not about history, but about values, shouldn't all Confederate monuments be removed and school names changed if the US is to begin the reparations process? And um, maybe there is another question connected to that, and maybe you can somehow take this as um, the basis for a, a, a summarizing answer. What is your take on a colorblind society? Oh, good questions. Um, <clears throat> So I did say all Confederate monuments have to go. I agree with that. The debate is now, what do we do with Jefferson and Washington and other people who were holding slaves? That is the debate in the States right now. I think we're coming to something like a consensus that, you know, and even these sort of red blooded, rather right-wing Americans can be caught by the argument we're really gonna name a military base after someone who committed treason by fighting against the country? Come on, guys. Uh, so uh, I agree that the Confederate monuments and names should go. Um, the question is what about somewhat more ambiguous figures like Jefferson and Washington who did own slaves, um, but it's not like they fought a war for the privilege of owning slaves and they did make some genuine contributions. So that's where I'm, that's where I am at the moment. But anybody, uh, you know, as I said, in the case of Woodrow Wilson, um, anybody who uh, 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 praises the Ku Klux Klan for protecting the Aryan nation is, uh, you know, doesn't belong on, on the name of a major university. That's clear. Colorblind, are you really colorblind? Can you see what color I'm wearing? I'm wearing blue today with a necklace with some yellow in it. Colorblind drives African-Americans absolutely nuts. And um, because nobody's colorblind and they will say, I mean, at least every African-American that I've ever discussed this with will say, if you say you don't see color, you're not seeing me. I can see perfectly well that you're white. I experienced this as a Jew in Germany where uh, I notice, and I'm glad you were an exception, Falka, um, people are extremely hesitant to say she's a Jew or she's a Jewish American. They will come up with these long phrases, jüdische Abstammung, Mitbürger jüdischen Glaubens. Sie kommt aus einer jüdischen Familie. And I keep having to tell people, you know, Jews don't consider it an insult <laughs> to be called Jewish. <laughs> That's just what we call ourselves. And when people, you know, so, so I've, I mean, I've, had I tell this story in the book, it's kind of funny, I won't tell it now, but um, you know, when somebody says, oh my God, that's not something I would notice. Everybody knows everything, anything about American culture, thinks that I grew up on the Upper West Side of New York City, which is a very Jewish um, part of New York, sort of where traditionally a lot of German Jewish uh, uh, refugees came, but anyway. Um, I don't consider it um, insulting at all for somebody to notice that I'm Jewish. That's, that's what I am, you know, and I can't quite explain. But, so I do not think that the goal should ever be not to notice 
ethnic differences. Mm -hmm. They are part of the world. And in fact, if you try to pretend you're not there, you're engaging in the kind of false universalism that unfortunately a lot of people in post-colonial studies consider to be genuine you know, that's all universalism is. It's imposing a, you know, white Eurocentric picture on the rest of the world. And therefore it's, there is no real universalism. I think there's a different position. I think that you can recognize people's common humanity uh, and common right to have rights as Arendt put it, but also enjoy recognizing and learning about different parts of their culture. I think that's the only way to go. But trying to be colorblind, um, first of all, it just doesn't work. You see the people are black or white, usually. I mean, of course there are African-Americans as they used to call. And it maybe papers over the underlying problems, right? Which continue. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So forget about colorblindness. Also forget the word tolerance, please. Do you want to be tolerated? No, you want to be respected. Tolerance is a word that came out of an eight, a 17th century debate about different religions. It doesn't apply to ethnicities uh, or it shouldn't apply to ethnicities. Um, so forget tolerance, forget colorblindness, take an interest in a different culture. Yeah, and you will find that you will learn not only about that other cu culture, but you'll learn more about yourself. And I think we have learned a lot about Germans, about Americans, about ourselves, about the current situation we're in. So thank you very much for this wonderful and lively uh, discussion of your book. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to reading more from you and um, take care. Well, thank I'm going to read your American exceptionalism book now. So well, I will let you know, but uh, the audience doesn't have to know. It will be out next year. Um, Corona prevented an earlier appearance or an earlier publication, but it's with the publishers. But I don't want to talk about myself. So thanks again, uh, Susan Nyman, for being for sharing uh, your thoughts, uh, your insights, and your book with us. Thank you very much.